Hey, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I used to say when I was in Myanmar, Allah ming le So good morning, and um, thank you very much for coming to the uh, U.S. Institute of Peace. My name is uh, Derek Mitchell. I'm a senior advisor here. Um, this uh, topic and this morning is something that um, I think has been long in coming and something very close to my heart, because uh, I think as all of you know, and as all of us have been engaged for years on the issue of uh, Myanmar, we have done it from the perspective of democracy building, human rights, the um, concern about military regime, that kind of thing. A uh, little bit of a buzz. Yeah. But, uh, and, and we've had an evolution in what's going on on the ground in, in the politics of the country. Uh, but as anybody who follows the place knows that the defining challenge of the country, of Myanmar, is really peace. National reconciliation is kind of a broad term, but peace. Um, there's been the longest running civil conflict in the world in this country, really since they had independence from the British, essentially. In the 1940s, they've never been at peace. They've never worked out uh, a way to be unified as one nation. And that has driven a lot of the developments, the underdevelopment and the other types of developments in the country for, uh, for 70 years. And I don't think that we in Washington, those of us who care about this country, understand this country in all its complexity. And now that we are in a new phase, uh, or a different phase of a kind, it's very important that we do understand that. And here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, um, I think we are going to take a much more, uh, we try to be a center for understanding what's going on, what's truly happening in this country, the real dynamics, the all, in all its complexity of what's happening. And today, I think we want to start, and this will be the beginning of a series of discussions uh, focusing on peace process and, and how we can understand it and maybe how we can assist this country to really get on track to become a, a model for Southeast Asia and go back to what I think it should be. Um, what we have today is two separate uh, sections here. First, we're going to hear from the ambassador, uh, Ong Lin, and then we're going to have a panel discussion uh, and I will introduce the panelists and the panel discussion in a moment. But first, I am extremely pleased to introduce to everybody um, the new ambassador here, Ambassador uh, Uang Lin. Um, just by background, he began his career in government in 1982, and uh, he was a geologist. I didn't realize this. <laughs> I know him from MOFA, but he has a background in geology. Uh, had, uh, had served in Hong Kong and South Africa and other places. He was the, the individual. He was a permanent secretary in MOFA until very recently, and the person that I worked with very closely during Myanmar's ASEAN year. And I have to say, just from a personal level, uh, I am so pleased when I heard when he was coming here, I felt good. They were sending their best, and I, I wondered who they would send. But he is a thorough professional, uh, a great individual, a patriot of his country, uh, and somebody that uh, will do a lot for U.S.-Myanmar relations and for Myanmar specifically. So uh, I just want to introduce to you uh, for some comments, and I think you will take a few questions, um, Ambassador Uong Lin. Uh, from the uh, Republic of the Union of uh, Myanmar. Thank you very much, uh, Derek, and uh, for your introduction. Uh, I would like to say hello to all of you. A very good morning. Uh, I thank you for giving me the chance of uh, taking part in this uh, public event. Ambassador Vijay Nambia, Ambassador Derek Mitchell, Country Coordinator Vanessa Johnson, Johansson, and uh, officials from the USIP, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. First of all, allow me to express my appreciation for having the opportunity to participate in this important event. This event is important and significant because it is the very first event held outside Myanmar that is related to our peace process. And moreover, it is because it is convened in the United States Institute of Peace. In addition, the subject that we are discussing today reflects the aims and purposes of the USIP. Furthermore, I am glad to see an assembly of 
enthusiastic people who have keen interest in the peace process in Myanmar. I am confident that the event will produce a very fruitful outcome. Peace is very precious to us. As Derek has mentioned, as a country that has faced numerous internal conflicts since its independence from Britain in 1948, insurgency erupted soon after the independence in our country. Thousands of combatants from both sides lost their lives, and hundreds of thousands of civilians suffered tremendously because of the nearly 70 years of conflicts. By looking back into these past ordeals, we find that all of the people who were affected were no other than our fellow countrymen. Realizing that peace is so important in nation building, successive governments of the country in the past tried vigorously by various means to achieve peace in the entire nation. Some were successful and some were not, but the country was never able to see peace in the whole country. Amid the challenges and success, challenges, successes and setbacks of the efforts in the past, we witnessed rays of hope for nationwide peace in recent years. Realizing that political dialogue was necessary in addressing the deep-rooted issues of the conflicts, the then government of President U Thein Sein started a ceasefire talks with the armed groups in August 2011. In two years, the government signed bilateral ceasefire agreements with 14 ethnic armed organizations. The efforts of all stakeholders involved in the conflicts led to the signing of a nationwide ceasefire agreement, NCA, on October 15, 2015. The agreement was signed between the government and eight ethnic armed groups. Although not all the armed groups did take part in the signing of the agreement, the door was kept open to all the remaining organizations. A joint ceasefire monitoring committee, GMC, to monitor the de-escalation of fighting and the Union Peace Dialogue Joint Committee, UPDJC, to facilitate political dialogue were formed following the signing of the agreement. The NCA was an important step towards the establishment of a federal and democratic union. The civilian government of the National League for Democracy emerged in April this year after winning a landslide victory in the November 15, 2015 elections. As the policy of the NLD is to hold political negotiations based on the Penlong spirit and the principle to finding solutions based on equal rights, mutual respect, and mutual confidence between all nationalities, the government decided to work towards a lasting peace. At the same time, the new government continued its efforts to bring about the participation of non-signatories in the peace process. In order to step up its efforts of peace, the government formed a preparatory committee of the Union Peace Conference, the 20th the 21st century Penlong, and established the National Reconciliation and Peace Center in place of the Myanmar Peace Center. The Union Peace Dialogue Joint Committee was also reformed, where the state councillor, Do Aung San Suu Kyi, took the role of the chairperson. On 31st August this year, the first session of the Union Peace Conference also known as the 21st Century Penlong, was convened in Nepido. Both NCA signatories and non-signatories participated in the event. In her opening speech at the Union Peace Conference, 21st Century Penlong, the State Councillor Doang San Suu Kyi stated that the conference was a unique opportunity for the country to accomplish the great task that remain as a landmark in its history. And she urged the participants not to miss the magnificent opportunity. 
She stressed that if all wanted to achieve the shared objectives of establishing a democratic federal union, it was vital to hold a 21st century Panlong that will enable all ethnic nationals to negotiate frankly, openly, and on equal terms as they did at the 20th century Panlong Conference. She also added that the conference was not watched only in Myanmar, but also the whole world to see how Myanmar, how far Myanmar was, Myanmar can go, and whether the nation can succeed in achieving lasting peace. There were no discussions made, no decisions made in the first conference. Nevertheless, it was the most inclusive and transparent conference convened in the history of Myanmar. On, a, on 15th of last month, the first anniversary of the NCA was convened in Naypyidaw. The state councillor and the chairperson of the NPRC delivered a speech by underscoring the importance of inclusiveness of all parties in the process and to think of the future generations to be free from woes and sorrows that the citizens have endured in the past and to leave the best legacy to the nation and to extinguish the burning, fire burning in the hearts, of the so hearts and souls of the people. She also outlined the seven-point roadmap for national reconciliation and union peace. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, peace is so precious to us. We cannot afford this to miss this golden opportunity that has come in front of us. In my opinion, I view peace as an international public good. Similar to lighthouses, street lamps, national defense, education, etc., it belongs to all of us <coughs> and all enjoy its benefit equally. Therefore, we must treasure it. People in the world are born with different fates or karmas, as we say. Some are born where peace exists in their country. Some witnessed peace while some saw it disappear in their lifetime. Still, there are people who do not see peace throughout their entire life. It is the dream of the people of Myanmar to see peace flourish in the whole country. We want to make our dreams come true at the time of our transition to democracy. We strongly believe that with the goodwill and genuine efforts of all the stakeholders in the country and the support from well-wishers around the world, we will see peace throughout the country in the near future. In conclusion, the public event today is timely and relevant to our peace process, and I do believe that it will contribute towards peace in our country and the, two, and the world as a whole. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, maybe um, if there are maybe one, maybe one question someone wants to ask, and then we'll we'll switch to the panel. But uh, yes. okay, yes, Kumar. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we need that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your presentation. Yes, Mr. Kumar. Uh, I'm Kumar from Amnesty International. Yes. Uh, my question is, something is developing in the north, uh, northern Myanmar, in Chin State and, and Shan State. Chin State is in the western part. Uh, sorry, yes. maybe geographically. Uh, there are concerns that uh, major military operation is going to take place and also no independent observers, media, are not going to be allowed in. If that's the case, there yes. is going to be mass killing of civilians there. All right. So how can that fit into your peace process? Okay. You, know, you can't expect when you kill people and say, come on, let's talk peace. Okay. Thank you. So Mr. Kumar, uh, uh, let me tell you very frankly, Chin State that you refer is the state uh, that is uh, in the western part of Myanmar. It's a very peaceful state. It's, uh, it is in the western part of Myanmar, and it's a hilly region. If you have any specific information about it, please let me know. We will address it. 
Yes. Okay. Okay. Kachin State. All right. Kachin State, uh, there are still are, are fightings in the, are between the armed forces, uh, the Tamaro and the KIA, KIA uh, insurgents. Uh, the government is taking uh, utmost restraint in uh, taking uh, action not to cause any uh, 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 sufferings to the civilians. I will come back to you, and uh, uh, if you have uh, any specific information about it, I can uh, I can talk with you uh, privately. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Louis Tam from Management Sciences for Health. I beg, I beg your pardon? Yes, uh, my name is Louis Tam. I represent Management Sciences for Health. We management Sciences <laughs> on um, Management Science for Health. Management Science for Health. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, in the peace process, yes. how important is the improved provision of basic health and social services to the population who has been traditional unders underserved vis-a-vis uh, -vis other elements of the peace process that are, are coming uh, that are being developed in the country all right uh, i will tell you the government as a provider of health service is trying its best uh, to reach uh, all these uh, areas that is uh, affected by the civil conflict but our uh, we have some uh, constraints and limits because uh, the, the will, uh, the service of uh, the government to provide health services cannot be reached, uh, cannot reach easily to these areas. So it is important for all, for all the combatants, for the stakeholders, and also the leaders from the, uh, uh, the armed group to give, uh, to permit uh, access of the health workers to their areas. That is important. Uh, uh, be sure that uh, government is doing its best to provide health, uh, health and education to all the uh, areas in the entire country. That is, the, that is why the peace process, uh, we are doing so uh, hard to get uh, to achieve peace in the entire country. Is that all? You want Only to do? It's all right. Uh, go. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, my name is Derek Brown. I'm a former fellow here and with the Peace Appeal Foundation currently. I'm wondering if you could speak to the relationship between the 21st century Pan Long, as you referred to it, and the d decisions and consensus you are trying to build there yes. with ultimately the decisions that need to be taken by Parliament and how recommendations coming out of uh, uh, the 21st century Pan Long, the PUPC, may be considered both at the state level and at the national level. What, yes, thank you very much. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, the parliament is supportive of the peace conference. Be sure that. The thing is that uh, there was one question raised uh, during the uh, visit of uh, the state councillor in Japan. Why the peace process is not in progress? She would simply uh, answer that it was because of the will of the people, because not, not all the people wanted to proceed the process. That is the difficulty. That is why she asked the people to extinguish the fires of hatred and anger that are, that are existing in the hearts and souls of the people. That is, uh, that is the message that uh, the state councillor uh, del delivered uh, during the, her visit in Japan. So be sure that uh, the parliament, the lawmakers are, are very supportive. They fully support the peace process. The entire, many of the, the majority of the people in the country support the peace process. Of course, there are several people, very few people still remain, uh, still remain the, to hold, uh, to, don't see, don't want to see the, uh, the peace process going on. I think it is uh, it is important for us to have a will uh, to process to proceed the process. Thank you. Yes. One more, are we good? <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank, thank you, very you very much, Derek. Thank thank you so much. Okay. So we'll make the transition to the panel, if we could.
I'll bring up Jay and Vanessa. How are we with David on the screen? Can't see him. Okay. Um, trying to make the smooth transition to the panel discussion now. We have um, three people who have um, a lot of experience on the ground and can give us a sense of the various components of, as I say, this, this very, very complex problem. And what we'll do is uh, I'll introduce all of them to start and then we'll just go uh, one by one through. To my right, my very good friend Vijay Nambiar, I worked very, very closely with when I was in, uh, in Myanmar. He, um, he joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1967. Puts us all, I read his bio for the first time. It puts us all to shame with his background, I have to say. Uh, 50 years in international service. Ambassador of India to Pakistan, China, Malaysia, Afghanistan. And Algeria. In uh, Algeria as well, that's right, in Algeria. Um, he was a special, he has, uh, he was special advisor to Kofi Annan, uh, the UN Secretary General. And he has been the Secretary General's special advisor on Myanmar for, since uh, 2010 which makes him the primary representative um, for the United Nations to the peace process. Uh, the UN and China were both uh, sort of official observers and he was the primary individual sitting in the room uh, as an observer to all the major uh, conversations that were going on bilaterally and multilaterally. Um, so we're very, very fortunate uh, to have Vijay here to provide his perspective on what he has seen. Um, and um, where, what the state of play is on the ground and what the international community can do to assist. Second to my left is uh, proudly the USIP country director and rep on the ground, Vanessa Johansson, who I knew in various uh, incarnations uh, when, when I was there. But we were very, it was really fortunate for USIP to, to grab her and pull her over, steal her from another organization, as it were. Um, she's worked uh, since 1996 in Asia, which is long enough. It's still it's not 50 years, but it's certainly a long time. Um, but worked in Asia and the Middle East on peace building, peace processes, governance and media development, and she has been, uh, we have extensive programming on the ground and she monitors the peace process very, very closely, and she will provide her perspective of what she has been observing um, in terms of the NGO involvement as well as overall peace developments. And on this screen that I can't see, but I guess we don't have video, we have audio, um, is uh, David Matheson who is also a very good and old friend, senior researcher on uh, Burma, Myanmar, in the Asia Division of Human Rights Watch. Um, he is now based in, in Thailand, uh, in Chiang Mai, uh, as, and is a, an academic, has been an academic researcher and has been with Human Rights Watch since August 2006, and really one of the best, most objective and sharp um, minds on what's happening on the ground. And he'll provide sort of a very granular sense of what people are thinking about on the ground in communities about this peace process, what has changed, what is the same. So I think we have three different angles to this issue. Um, it is, uh, I think many, some of you probably have grounding in this, so you may understand all the acronyms. <laughs> some of you may not, so try to, we'll try, I mean, I'm not even up to all the acronyms nowadays, they change so quickly. Uh, but we'll try to make sense of this complex situation and hit all the, the angles to this over the next 90 minutes. So first, uh, it's my honor and pleasure to uh, turn to Vijay, provide initial comments. Uh, please. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, thank you, Derek. <coughs> Let me first of all, of course, start off by thanking you uh, both um, for the very close cooperation that the United Nations had, has had with the U.S. mission uh, under your leadership in Yangon, the, when you were both special advisor of the U.S. government on Myanmar as well as the head of mission in Myanmar. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, history will probably record your personal contribution to the changes, so I don't need to say very much, but I can certainly say that uh, in general terms, I must say that they were critical, and at a critical time for the United States. And, uh, and personally, I have felt the support and the 
the occasional buttressing that the United Nations inevitably needs from big powers, apart from the P5 for off and on, and also the understanding uh, that some of the times when we've had to work uh, slightly, in a sense, offline, uh, that we were able to keep uh, in touch very closely. For the United Nations and representing the United Nations, this is an important day today because the Climate Change Convention comes into operation today. It's a huge thing, historically, I think, and uh, I think in that, that's one general point about the United Nations which makes today somewhat significant. The other point specifically to Myanmar is not so much today as this session of the, uh, of the United Nations uh, General Assembly, which, if it follows the current indications and track, will probably the f be the first session in about 25 years where there may not be a resolution on Myanmar in the general, adopted by the General Assembly. I mean, for the last 25 years, there has been what Myanmar has been calling the finger-pointing resolution. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know how important it has been. I think it has been important. In fact, the good offices started certainly since 1993 on, in terms of the, an interpretation of the, uh, of the resolution. And I recall one of my predecessors uh, was not even allowed entry into Myanmar, even though he was a special advisor. And he described the office of the special advisor and his role and duties as visiting a dentist. He says, it's something that had to be done. It was painful, but it had to be done. And so from that process in the, the early 90s and uh, <clears throat> when the good offices moved, we've come a long way, particularly after uh, Cyclone Nargis and the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's personal involvement. And I think that is a history. And my, my own uh, presentation today, I don't think I should be dealing with that kind of history because it will take too much time. Uh, even on the peace process, I will not delve into the historical part, but just talk about the most recent past and what is happening in, the, in, in, in what I think is good could happen or the implications are uh, for, the, uh, for the coming months and years. Uh, <clears throat> let me s relate this, first of all, of course, to the political transformation taking place today, the, which is very real and in many respects unprecedented. But one must recall, one must remember that it is, cannot also be said that it has reached a stage that you can consider irreversible. Why do I say that? <clears throat> uh, it's not that the challenge of nation building in Myanmar is that different from anywhere else. It has its specificities, obviously everyone knows. It has had half, a half century of chaotic democratic development in the early stages, autocratic and paternalistic military rule, economic stagnation, dependence, isolation, natural disaster, and of course externally imposed sanctions. It's coming out of all that now. It has an elected government. It started in 2010 under a, maybe a flawed election, but it started a process of civilization through military officers taking off their uniforms, but progressively they've moved, and I think steadily, till November 8th last year, when you had a genuine, uh, free, genuinely free election, which brought in, in place the icon of Myanmar as the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize winner, the, uh, the redoubtable Dao Aung San Suu Kyi. <coughs> but, <coughs> I think the reform process is still in a nascent, is in a nascent stage, and it will depend essentially and quite critically on continuing stable relations of cooperation between the new political leadership and the army, the military. As long as the threat of fragmentation of the country along ethnic lines remains a clear and present danger, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> The army will see this as sufficient reason for it to retain control over the critical departments of the union government under the present constitution, like defense, home affairs, border affairs, nor is it likely to concede its hold of the 25% of the total number of seats in parliament. Senior military leaders have given clear indication that unless the government, the, the army is convinced of visible progress in the national reconciliation talks and regional stability, including those posed in Rakhine, which of course is a totally different discussion, 
uh, <clears throat> it would be unwilling to agree to any drastic dilution of its role in the governance of the nation. Critical to any willingness of the army to step aside, uh, to step away from the decisive political control would naturally therefore be the launch of a political dialogue that would bring the the ethnic armed groups irrevocably away from the path of military confrontation. That is perhaps the reason why the army sees any promise of progress to be in a form of what they call DDR or SSR by these army groups, that is the disarmament, demobilization, uh, and reintegration or security sector re reform. Uh, <clears throat> this they see essentially as a prelude to any negotiation, even on the contours of a new federal state. <clears throat> Given the lack of trust over the years which continues between the ethnic armed groups and the army, this goal is unlikely to be achieved at an early stage. <clears throat> On its part, the new NLD leadership has also identified national reconciliation through a political dialogue as a fundamental priority. They see broad-based power sharing between the government, the army, and the different groups as a way to set up a new inclusive political and constitutional structure that meets the aspirations of as much of the majority community as of the diverse ethnic groups. But whereas the NLD would like to see the progress, the army progressively divest itself of a national political role, the NLD is fairly sensitive to what the, the army, the Tamadao, has described as the three principles of non-disintegration of the country, non-disintegration of national solidarity, and perpetuation of the sovereignty. Now, for the ethnic armed organizations, they are sympathetic with the NLD's desire to see the role of the military diminished, to see the role between one composite representation of the ethnic armed groups, of almost 15 ethnic armed groups, in what is called the NCCT, or the Nationwide Ceasefire Coordination Team, representing all the 15 ethnic armed groups as one delegation. And I think it's very interesting, for the first time perhaps ever in the history, they were all, they were all negotiating with the government and the army as a, as a kind of a team working between each other, despite their different interests. And in fact, in March of 2015, they were able to virtually come to a more or less agreed text of a nationwide ceasefire. That, that particular ceasefire agreement was eventually signed in October by only eight groups, uh, was in a sense a slip between cup and lip in many ways, but <clears throat> I think it, there were other issues, and to some extent, I think it was a question of as they, as they negotiated, I think going back to the principles, each of the principles, particularly the political leadership, began to have different views of how to cope with this particular uh, agreement. That they, and I think some of the northern groups particularly found it very difficult. The UNFC, the United Nation Nationalities Federal Council, found that they, perhaps the negotiators had stepped a little too far. And that accounts for sense of kind of uh, a kind of a stepping back, <clears throat> which we see in the, uh, we saw this uh, in Lokilar, for example, immediately after after the, uh, the 
general agreement on a text in March 2015. I think it was two months later that the ethnic armed groups had a summit at which their differences again, once again, came forth. And it was difficult. They used the argument uh, of uh, non-inclusivity, which is also important. There were about three or four uh, armed groups, particularly the Kokang, the TNLA, and others who were not being uh, brought into the into the mainstream as signatories for the uh, for the for the uh, NCA, the, the ceasefire agreement, and that created the 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 distinction which is now very uh, very current that is between the signatories and the non-signatories. But in fact, the nationwide ceasefire did get get signed. The first meeting, indeed, of the uh, the political the framework of political dialogue took place. In fact, before the NLD government actually came in place after the elections, but in, in January, and the lady Dao Aung San Suu Kyi herself attended this, and in a sense, her attendance gave. Uh, imprimatur, as it were, that the new government would follow on the footsteps of the old government in pursuing the peace process, more or less, I wouldn't say with, with obviously with various uh, 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 nuances of change, but more or less getting all the armed groups on one track of a peace process. And I think this has been the, the trajectory which the present government has been following. It creates, of course, the current difficulty of the non-signatories and the signatories, the non-signatories being, in fact, by and over by a large uh, margin, the main political, uh, the main military forces, the, all, the more powerful military forces are those who are not signing, in fact. So this creates a new situation. But from the viewpoint of the signatories, after the signature of the, uh, of the <coughs> nationwide ceasefire in October, the credibility of the process has been maintained, at least from the point of view of the government and the army. Uh, <clears throat> some of the things that happened, the agreed mechanisms of the Joint Ceasefire Monitoring Committee to deal with military matters, and the, what the uh, ambassador said, the UPDJC, it's a very interesting acronym, <laughs> the Union Peace Dialogue Joint Committee, uh, for the political matters were set up in time, and the terms of reference was finalized and approved in time. A military code of conduct was worked out within 30 days, as discussed. The political dialogue framework came in 60 days. The first political dialogue convened in 90 days. Exact the kind of trajectory which they had worked out actually was implemented in good faith, one would say, by both sides. <coughs> the, the, uh, <coughs> and in fact, the first Union Peace Conference held in January was attended by the Aung San Suu Kyi before the formation, as I said. <clears throat> and some of the signatories also enjoyed the benefits, as it were, uh, that came from having been having signing um, from signing a ceasefire agreement. That is, they were granted exemption from the Unlawful Association Act, which, uh, which in fact, under Burmese law, uh, the ethnic armed groups you are not supposed to have contact with the ethnic armed groups. That contact, that exam, that uh, uh, the prohibition of contact was removed in the case of the signatories, and in fact, many of them were able to set up liaison offices and have public consultations with political parties, etc. In fact, in the Shan state, this led to the formation of a committee of Shan state unity, joining two main political parties and some of the armies to help ref reflect a common concern. In a sense, therefore, what is happening is that the peace process was beginning to get into, into, into really working mode, as it were. But I don't think that you can say that it has really reached a stage where it is working, mainly because the major... Uh, major ethnic armed groups are still outside this particular process. <clears throat> For the population in some of the ethnic areas, some comfort, according to organizations like the RCSS, which is the Restoration Council of Shan State, which is one of the major uh, signatories, uh, there were some advantages which the people actually got wind or got, got an idea of, that is, uh, so, you know, frequent exoduses after skirmishes was actually much less. The forced portering was much less in, in these places. Even some, I understand, I was told that some demining activities had taken place. Networking with civil societies was, uh, was, was be, had begun, and some preliminary, preliminary effort to address 
health care, education, environmental conservation, promotion of ethnic culture, that was also being considered. Of course, it's obviously just the beginning, but they began to see the prospect, the hope of that happening. And to that extent, therefore, the process was in fact crying out to be continued at a faster pace. But actually, it has not happened. <coughs> Because mainly the non-signatories of the government of the of the uh, NCA, <clears throat> with regard to the non-signatories, of course the army, the uh, both the army and the government has been saying that they must find a way to commit them to the to the process to see some way in adding inclusivity, to get them to join the political dialogue. But the question is, the uh, non-signatories want to join the political dialogue on par with the signatories. Now, there is a basic difficulty about that, and that is why this insistence on one track has become, for example, in a sense, a kind of a constraint for the, the government and the army to insist upon. Uh, <clears throat> and the Aung San Suu Kyi has all along insisted that there will be only one negotiating track. And from that point of view, she was able to at least get, because of the immensity of the historicity of the change that came about as a result of her becoming the, 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 uh, the leader uh, and her announcement of the 21st century Panglong, I think it was difficult for the ethnic armed groups to be seen as, as boycotting <laughs> such an important initiative so early by the new government, elected, elect, uh, the, uh, the popularly elected government. The second thing is, I think there was some deaf diplomacy also take, uh, done because I think the, la the lady's visit to uh, China had helped the Chinese to also put in, pu push in a little bit of their subtle pressures on some of the northern groups, and particularly the announcement of Wa that they would attend the, uh, the Panglong in, on the 31st of August. Uh, this came at a time when the other both non-signatories and signatories were meeting in as an, at an ethnic group summit in a place called Maja Yang. In some ways, they were blindsided. They found that while they were discussing what may be the conditionalities of joining the process, the uh, <clears throat> the announcement came of Wa also joining at the 21st century Panglong. And an important constituents like the KIO found, in a sense, that they also had to move in that direction. There was a little bit of, uh, of uh, misgiving, but I think by and large the public messaging was politically correct. All of them moved towards the... Having done that, uh, of course, almost uh, uh, there was some, some details, there was some details, but I think those details <coughs> tend to be, become uh, politically relevant. The VA, after joining, within one day of joining, actually walked out of the meeting. Uh, uh, they walked out because of perceived protocol uh, sort of slights and things like that. Uh, the KIO joined initially and put tremendous pressure and was able to succeed in actually addressing the inaugural meeting, which was again a kind of a, the, 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 as between the various armed groups, this created a certain amount of imbalance. And I think that is now informing some of the difficulties that you are now seeing in the, in the preparations for the second stage. <coughs> and. Though there has been some detente between the, 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 the signatories and the non-signatories, they are actually getting in contact with each other, but one sees, a, 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 one sees a growing kind of difference, a kind of difficulty, and the non-signatories are increasingly becoming very, uh, they are actually suggesting that while the lady is, is talking publicly about uh, uh, about inclusivity, about reaching out to the non-signatories, and about seeing the need to make this process credible only by inclusion of the bigger parties, the bigger ethnic groups. How they're going to do it, she is facing difficulties in terms of formulating a, 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 an acceptable way of negotiating with the, with the agreement of the army. And that essentially boils down, and from various public statements you can see, it essentially boils down to this critical factor of DDRSSR. 
I think the the the, uh, the, uh, the some of the non-signatory representatives, like the UNFC and others, have presented a group of a set of eight points, of which they say even in the process after the 21st century Pangalum, that is, on middle October, there were some discussions. Uh, uh, consultations and, and preparations for the next political meeting, broad agreement on the need to have a federal state is, of course, now accepted. I think the government has accepted that they, that they will look forward to a federal state. But how that is to be reached, what kind of uh, conditionalities, what for most of the ethnic armed groups, they are still talking about a united federal army. And I think that is still something which, how will the army, will this just, what is this whole reconfigure, will there be a reconfiguration of the armed forces and what will become of the ethnic arm, the forces, the arms, uh, the, the structures of the uh, uh, ethnic forces? What will happen to the question of the the continued uh, holding of arms by the ethnic armed groups. So demobilization, when will it take place? There's no way in which most of the ethnic armed groups, particularly the KIO, WA, and others, are going to give up their arms unless they reach a stage where they are sufficiently uh, convinced that this process is going to go on an irreversible process. Just as the army has a problem, they have a problem. So where is this mistrust which has been coming going for 60 years, where is that going to be resolved? This is going to be the critical factor. My own sense of this has been that these are issues which have long plagued the relationship, and they can only be solved by one, on the one hand, of course, political statements by the government are important. A sense that the, that, the, that the political leadership can actually insist with the army that the larger political um, compulsions be adhered to. That has to, there has to be some uh, credibility about that process. And of course, there must be a larger number, much greater number of informal relationships, informal contacts between the government and the ethnic armed groups over the period of the of the negotiations. In the case of the earlier government, President Tencent's government, I think the chief negotiator was Minister Ong Min, who as a former military officer and as a person who over the years has been able to has been able to retain a certain credibility with the with the ethnic armed groups. I think he was able to reach out to them with much greater credibility and with much greater authority. His grasp of the issues and his not needing to keep turning all the time to his president for, you know, for, for sort of, um, uh, let's say, for endorsing even minor concessions that he may make informally, that helped him move the process forward. To an extent, I feel that that kind of flexibility does not happen, does not, is not evident now, partly because the nature of the relationship has changed, but I think to an, to an extent it is the absence of more informal contacts. And I think that is perhaps the most important thing that is needed as you move along to the second stage. There are many details of this process which they have been, the, the, the various uh, groups have been talking about. Uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, I don't know if you will have much of a, a, a stomach for those details, but I think it's essentially a question of the, how the military relationship will work uh, and how the, the structure of autonomy, of power sharing, of resource sharing is going to be, to be carried out in a manner where there is confidence on the part of the uh, of the ethnic armed groups at present i think there is a sense on on the particularly in the on the side of the some some of the major ethnic armed groups in places where uh, resources resource rich areas where they are afraid that they may be you know conceding and then suddenly they will lose control i think there has to be a slow process of uh, reassurance that has that needed to be done. The lady has been, in fact, the most recent phase, I think uh, just about, I think, 28th of October, or uh, she's made some, in mid-October, she made some points, and she has actually changed the 
uh, the, 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 the method of reaching out now. Just last, uh, last uh, just two weeks ago, when she has actually uh, <clears throat> raise the possibility of many levels of contact and many levels of negotiation. A national level, regional level, topic level, as she says, and uh, uh, I think there's some other, one more level which she talked about. This is a very interesting way of proceeding, and she has said that this is directed mainly by her interest in being, in being more inclusive to include others also. Uh, it is clear that as you move forward, the old system of one consolidated coordinating coordinated negotiating team on the side of the of the of the ethnic armed groups like the NCCT is unlikely to happen now. I think as you go along next, it's going to there's already several negotiating kind of clusters, and that I think already means that there's going to be a lot of uh, of confusion in the in the negotiations. Now, when she has come, she's added an additional level of perhaps not confusion but of complexity by having levels of discussion at the national, regional, and which will include separate ethnic armed groups. It will require much greater degree of coordination. And I, it's, uh, it, this is going to be a huge problem. And therefore, the only organized institution in this entire setup is really the army. So the army does have a relative uh, kind of uh, advantage. But I think it's the political leadership that is going to be most important. My own sense is that while she is moving forward, she is trying essentially to reach out to these non-signatories, but the non-signatories still are not convinced that this is actually happening. On the one hand, even recently, last week, the KIO at the, at the I think, the 50th anniversary, they said that the lady is talking peace, but the army is actually heightening the tension, and there is today huge tension on the, on the border. Add to that the complexities in war, which is a, a, a new problem where, in fact, the, the, uh, the commander-in-chief has had to go to China recently to visit China when it, this happened a few days after an ultimatum which the army had given to the VA to withdraw from uh, uh, an area was actually ignored. So it's going to be, this, as you go along, there's going to be a huge degree of complexity in terms of how the discussion takes place. But uh, there is still a political capital which the government, the NLD government has has today, which they can move forward to take, uh, to, to, they can use to take forward the, uh, the, my only problem is how far the external, the outside world can be involved. For a long time, the, uh, the army has been insistent on national ownership, and I think that will be the main theme of the discussion and the negotiations. But increasingly, I think they do feel there is need for outsiders to come in at different, at different levels. And this, uh, let's say, this added complexity of many levels of negotiation, informal negotiation, may provide outsiders also some opportunities for, uh, uh, for sort of entering this process. Uh, I think that this is both a challenge uh, and uh, uh, I think it is likely that once uh, external players get into the, it gives an additional degree of complexity and there I would not rule out geopolitical sort of interests then coming, playing a major role. China is an important player in this, in this field and they have uh, been very, very worried about external other powers getting interested in, in their, in their uh, in, immediately in their uh, border regions. And I think that remains to be seen how the process will move forward. On the whole, therefore, I might just, uh, I mean, I, I don't think I could read this now. Uh, I think I should perhaps say that while the process still holds promise and I, I'm, I'm confident that it will move forward, the, I think it will move forward much slower in a, in a sense that the, the political process will move in, 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 at many levels and I think there is the, the reason, the, the only way in which it can move forward is if the army does not push too strongly its insistence on DDR and, the, and SSR in a manner where, or, or it also at the same time 
does exercise much more constraint on the border regions in terms of the uh, the tensions that are operating there. Sorry, I've got uh, taken much more than the 10 minutes you talked about. <laughs> okay. But it's still very interesting and a good way to give a foundation and grounding into what we're going to be discussing. Let me just turn now to Vanessa for a follow up. Thank you very much, Mingalava. Good morning. I'd like to cover three issues this morning. Um, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about what has happened so far under the NLD government in terms of peace process developments. The other speakers have covered a lot of that um, ground already, so I won't go into too much detail there, but just an overview. Um, secondly, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we might expect in the coming period with regard to the peace process. And then um, thirdly, and, and perhaps most importantly, I'd like to talk about some, um, some key concerns um, that I think are, are imperative for, for us to, um, to continue uh, uh, watching and and, and following and trying to assist Myanmar with going forward with this peace process. Um, so, I mean, broadly speaking, as the other speakers have said, the peace process has been um, a major priority, if not the major priority, for um, the NLD government. Um, a lot of uh, attention, resources, political capital has gone into, um, into this process so far. Um, the, um, unfortunately, however, the, um, the, the process so far is, uh, you know, if we go back to basics, what are the goals of this peace process? Um, they're essentially twofold. One is to, um, to achieve a, a ceasefire, to achieve an end to violence in most, if not all, areas of the country um, as, the, as the first goal. And the second goal is the sort of the deeper, uh, longer term process of political dialogue um, towards federalism, constitutional reform, and addressing some of the, the deep rooted um, conflicts in the country. So, um, so while the process has so far been a huge priority, those, uh, those key goals um, still remain um, a major challenge um, to be faced by this government going forward. Um, the um, as the other speakers mentioned, you know the the, um, the major event of the peace process uh, so far this this year under this government was the um, the 21st century Panglong Union Peace Conference that was held in Naypyidaw in um, August and September. Um, it was, uh, uh, as Ambassador Uang Lin mentioned, it was indeed the, the the most inclusive peace process event we've seen. Um, so in that in that respect, it was um, it was able to bring together more um, of the ethnic armed groups than had ever been in the room before with the government and the army. And, and other stakeholders, um, and, and where um, UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon was also there speaking. So it was a, um, a very significant event, um, and it was able to give voice to people, um, and um, and had some influence, I think, on building trust um, between, uh, particularly with the non, -sign non signatories in the process. Um, so um, of course, uh, you know, it, it didn't make any decisions, and so um, and so, uh, you know, we're we're sort of back to looking at how do we go forward in in negotiating ceasefire. Uh, ceasefire with um, the many groups that are not yet uh, have not yet signed a ceasefire um, and are not and and in many cases are not yet experiencing um, a uh, peace or an end to violence um, in their areas um, and. Uh, uh, and and um, that are not yet included in a broader political dialogue process going forward. So, um, so in terms of in terms of what might happen next. Um, so first, look at the ceasefire. Um, as let's see if I can get some visuals here. Okay, um, is that working? Yes. Um, <coughs> So, uh, as uh, as Mr. Nambia mentioned, the the vast majority of the troop strength of the ethnic armed groups, um, uh, sorry, the vast majority of the troop strength of the ethnic armed groups is represented by non-signatories. So, so most of most of the troops um, uh, held by the ethnic armed groups are held by non-signatory groups in the country. And you can see from this visual that um, the groups that have um, have signed the nationwide ceasefire agreement, um, the, the the data is very difficult to come. By, but they, they, the, the signatory groups represent about a quarter of a quarter to or a fifth of the of the uh, of the um, of the troop strength of the ethnic armed groups, and the the largest of the ethnic armed groups, um, such as the UWSA, the WA, um, the Kachin, the KAO, um, the the Shan State Army North. Um, and some of the others are either have a bilateral ceasefire, uh, usually a, a short document that was signed in the last five years um, with the previous government, um, or uh, or have no ceasefire at all. So. Um, 
so, you know, the, a major challenge going forward, um, of course, is, is negotiations with, with um, these non-signatory groups. Um, so both the government and the, um, the Tatmadaw, the Myanmar army, have made it very clear that, um, that signing the, the NCA, um, that the one um, nationwide ceasefire agreement is a prerequisite for participation in political dialogue. Um, so um, while most of the um, groups are, are, are keen to participate in this, um, this very important um, and, and, and complex conversation, um, they, uh, they, there, there is an insistence, and that was an insistence that was reiterated at the Panglong conference in August, um, that they sign the NCA before they participate in political dialogue. Um, so I guess one, uh, one thing to sort of say about the negotiating challenge um, going forward is that um, the non-signatories are not one block. Um, they, you know, there, there's, there've been attempts at, at um, collective negotiation, um, in some, some cases quite successful and impressive attempts at collective negotiation, but, um, but, uh, but they're not one block in terms of their relationship with the government and the peace process. Um, and um, uh, uh, there, are there are different alliances and they're shifting alliances. So, um, so it really is an enormous challenge for, um, for the, the government's um, new peace architecture, um, the, the, the National Reconciliation and Peace Centre and, and Peace Commission. Um, the, I guess the, the, I would um, describe the non-signatories as being in three, um, three categories or three groupings. Um, the first is the seven-member United Nationalities Federal Council, um, which is led by the, the Kachin, the KAO. Um, they have been in um, the, the the government has has um, has um, made extended extensive effort, efforts at outreach and negotiation with them. Um, as Mr. Nambia mentioned, they um, they have presented an eight point um, uh, an eight point program or an eight point um, uh, proposal to the government, um, um, which is which is under negotiation as we speak. I think there's an, another negotiation on those eight points next week. Um, some of those points are, are very easily negotiated from the government's perspective, and some of them such as having international um, adjudicators of ceasefire violations are much more difficult. Um, so there, there are a couple of points in those eight points that really want to bring a much more, a much greater international element into this process, um, a process which thus far has been um, as very much a, a local, a locally led um, and managed process with, um, with limited international involvement. So, um, so that's one group, the UNFC, um, ongoing negotiations there, and in, in a sense, um, they're the group that, um, if if any of the the non-signatories are. Um, are uh, are likely to come on board with the NCA. That's it's it's some of the the members of the UNFC. Um, the second group of non-signatories um, that um, that the government has uh, is, is in negotiations with is, is are the three that have been the subject of conversations around inclusiveness over the last few years, um, and that have a, a pretty negative relationship with the Myanmar Army, have been in conflict and so on. And that's the the um, the TNLA, the Taang, the Arakan Army, the AA, and the MNDA, which is the Kokang um, group, which was in. Um, major conflict um, the early part of last year with the government army. Um, <coughs> so um, these groups have no bilateral ceasefires. Um, they are still in conflict. Um, they, they have, as I said, they have a negative relationship. They did not, they were the, the three groups that did not, the, the only of the three, only three significant ethnic armed groups which did not attend the Panglong conference in August. Um, and um, they, they will really be, you know, there, there, there are huge challenges there um, with regard to um, insistence on um, demobilization um, from the from the government side with those groups so that they will probably be the most difficult negotiating challenge going forward for the government um, and then the third the third group the third grouping um, is is the WA the largest um, ethnic armed group the UW, UWSA um, and its ally the NDAA which is the Mongla group um, the, the WA have repeatedly said that they don't want to sign the NCA because they're at peace with the government um, and they have a bilateral ceasefire. Um, however, they're in regular meetings with the government. Um, they, they're, they've expressed the, their enthusiasm to join a political dialogue process. Um, so, um, they, they, um, and they, they, they hope that that political dialogue process will lead to achieving some of their broader aspirations, including um, a, WA, a separate WA uh, state, um, similar to Kachin state and, and, and Shan state and so on, a, a separate state for the WA. Um, also likely a huge negotiating challenge um, there, particularly if there's an insistence that the WA signed the nationwide ceasefire agreement before um, joining the political dialogue process. 
So just to give you, you a sense, that's just to give you a sense of, um, of where things, um, the, the challenges ahead in terms of in terms of negotiations. In terms of um, where things stand with the political dialogue process, so um, the political dialogue has been launched, as we know, it was launched by the previous governor, government and then relaunched in August um, at the Panglong Conference. Um, it's, uh, and just uh, as of last weekend, uh, a new political dialogue framework um, was agreed um, by the government and the signatory organisations. Um, the framework um, allows for, you know, it, it describes um, who can participate, um, what what's on the agenda, um, the a time frame for the different dialogues. So it's it's a good it's a good way of, of helping um, take the next steps there. So. Um, the, in, a, in a moment, I'll show you a graphic that, just, that explains a little bit further about um, how that political dialogue might move forward. Um, but I wanted to just go into a little bit more detail in terms of the um, the, um, the government's roadmap for peace, um, as I think was also mentioned by the ambassador, by Ambassador Wong Lin. Um, so the government, as of um, a couple of weeks ago, on the first anniversary of the nationwide ceasefire agreement, the government um, published its uh, its new uh, pol peace policy or roadmap. Which I think I have here. Yeah. Um, so um, it's a seven-step roadmap. Um, you know, very ambitious. It appears to be. It doesn't have a, a time frame attached to it, but appear, it appears to be um, a sort of a four to five year plan, four or five year plan. Um, and uh, you know, going through um, the, the political dialogue framework review, um, the fourth step is a uh, um, signing what they're calling a 21st century Panglong Conference Agreement, which we under understand to be a, a, a comprehensive peace agreement. Um, uh, amending the constitution, holding multi-party ele elections in accordance with the new constitution, and then number seven, building a democratic federal union um, after those elections. So. Um so uh, just to, s to say that this is, um, you know, it, it's very positive that the government has expressed, has sort of made public and expressed um, where it thinks it's going with this process, even if um, this plan is, uh, uh, I guess, a unilateral um, plan. It's not one that's been agreed um, with, the, with the armed groups or the other parties to the process. Um, the, um, another thing that's interesting about this framework, um, th those of you that have seen the Nationwide Ceasefire Agreement might recognise a seven-step, there's a seven-step roadmap also mm. um, inside the Nationwide Ceasefire Agreement. Um, and this is similar but different. Um, and one of the significant differences um, in this one is that there is no mention of security sector reform or demobilisation in this, um, which I think is very interesting that that was, um, that was left out um, and perhaps was, um, was partly done to, I don't know, I don't, look, I don't know. I don't know, but I think I think there are there are many people that are quite happy to see that. <laughs> that, that that question, of course, is is still a, a fundamental one and and will need to be discussed. But it's not um, incorporated as an essential part of moving forward with political dialogue on constitutional constitutional reform. Um, so, uh, just to talk briefly about the the time frame for. Uh, it's a very small one, sorry, um, but at least so this is this is what was agreed last weekend in terms of um, the the framework for political dialogue going forward. Um, it describes uh, about a two-year time frame um, with many different um, topics and forums and um, levels of dialogue um, around a range of issues. You can see there are five sectors there. Um, um, political, economic, social, security, and land and environment um, sectors. Um, the uh, civil society organisations are um, are now formally part of the process, but only in economic, um, social, and land and environment sectors, and not in political and security sectors, um, which is. Um, which is a shame. <laughs> um, and the security, you can see that the security sector issue that's in there is, um, is there's really, uh, th there's a plan to do it, at, and but it's only going to be carried out at the union level. It's not going to be devolved to the state level or to um, other forums. Um, and there's no sort of, uh, yeah, there's no sort of clear framework yet for discussing the security sector, it being, of course, the most sensitive um, area in the process. So, um, but I mean, one, one positive thing um, as of the, you know, one positive development with this new framework I think is that um, the the po the the both the, the the whole peace process, including the political dialogue discussions so far, there's a sense that they've been very elite-driven, um, very male-driven, um, and that um, and that now that um, this process is going to op open the process up to some degree to to other actors, to civil society actors, um, to women leaders, um, to um, 
to ethnic leaders that are not ethnic, not necessarily ethnic armed group leaders, but who are civilian um, ethnic leaders and so on. So, um, so that's it's quite a positive development. Um, there's a plan for a way forward there. Um, so. Um, yeah, so to just to state, I guess, I have sort of five key concerns, um, considerations, I think, going forward. Um, one is, of course, the ongoing fighting, and, um, and um, David Matheson will talk in a moment about, about some of that. Um, but, um, you know, the, uh, the, the ongoing fighting is, is, I would say, one of the roadblocks for negotiating ceasefires with, with all of the groups and for trust in the existing ceasefire with, um, with nationwide ceasefire agreement with the other groups. Um, it's, it's been mostly in the northeast but of course there's also been fighting recently in, in Kane State. Rakhine State um, and elsewhere. So, um, and, and um, it, in some cases, it appears to have actually escalated since the Panglong Conference. Um, so, um, you know, there's a feeling that there may be a strategy to pressure the non-signatory groups into signing, to militarily pressure the non-signatory groups into signing um, the NCA, um, and that's uh, that's something that, um, that yeah, it's 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 very concerning and hasn't worked so far. So, um, is unlikely to work in the future. Second concern, um, you know, the, the nationwide ceasefire agreement is a little over one year old now, um, um, but most as aspects of it, um, you know, it's, it's a sort of a hybrid political um, and ceasefire document, um, and most aspects of it, both political um, and ceasefire aspects, um, are yet to be implemented. Um, and so the, you know, and that, this includes um, crucially the the um, joint monitoring mechanism, the joint uh, joint mo joint monitoring committees um, in the process. So. Um, one year after the, the NCA was signed, we're now seeing, as of this week, we're now seeing the, the very first um, JMC verification mission um, to, um, to look into a particular um, apparent violation of ceasefire. So, um, so, of course, ceasefire monitoring is a very sensitive area. It's one that, um, that involves um, a lot of uh, um, negotiation of detail um, and a lot of uh, what's perceived, I think, to be prying into um, the business of, of the, the troops on the ground and so on, but, um, but this is something that's absolutely essential to make this, um, make any ceasefire effective. So, um, so, um, so, so ceasefire monitoring amongst other aspects of the NCA um, are yet to be implemented and, um, and um, should be looked at going forward. Third concern um, the, is the capacity of the government's um, existing peace architecture. So, um, as, as everybody has mentioned, um, the, you know, the, the, um, there is a new peace ar government peace architecture. The previous Myanmar Peace Centre was dismantled and uh, the National Reconciliation and Peace Centre was established um, with a, a peace commission under it, um, which is essentially a set of advisors. Um, and they are um, some, some very qualified and experienced people. Um, some of them are from the previous um, peace architecture, but it's very small um, and, um, and I, th I think has um, fairly limited autonomy and mandate um, to go forward with negotiations, as, as Mr. Nambia mentioned. Um, so um, going from a, an, an MPC, which had 100 and something staff, 150, I don't, I don't remember, over 100 staff, um, to a very small team, um, with um, which is not um, not as empowered as, as, as it, it probably should be um, to, to go forward with negotiations. Um, Again, it's early days, so um, looking forward, hopefully that will that will change. Fourth concern, um, the, you know, looking at this political dialogue um, content itself. I mean, we we're looking at trying to negotiate um, things like um, natural resource revenue sharing. Um, of course, you know, the, the shape of the the army in the future. What happens to the, the ethnic armies? Um, the uh, you know, basically incredibly complex and difficult issues. Not only difficult issues to understand, but even more difficult difficult to negotiate. Um, so. Um, so just the very um, the sort of the very challenge of, of, of dealing with some of those meaty negotiations going forward, um, and and fifth, um, last but definitely definitely not least is um, the question of representation um, in the process. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, the process seems to be broadening just a little bit, um, but it's got a long way to go in terms of um, civil society participation, um, both in terms of civil society participation in in, um, in uh, ceasefire monitoring process as well as um, uh, in, in political dialogue, participation of women, um, 
um, and others as well as ethnic leadership. Um, so um, in conclusion, <laughs> um, a lot of territory covered in a very short time, um, but in conclusion, um, I think uh, I would agree that there is, um, we can need to continue to support this process. There's a lot of hope for the process, um, but most of the major challenges uh, still lie ahead and, um, and there's a huge agenda going forward to, to support this process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Really important, comprehensive um, overview of what's going on. David, are you on the phone? You, we've kept you quiet. Call dropped. Oh, call dropped. Okay. <laughs> Has it been dropping on a regular basis? Okay. I guess we were saying the other day, maybe the wires are running through. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, David, um, thank you for joining us. This is Derek uh, here. Uh, we've just heard from VJ and Hello from there. Vanessa very well, and we're really, really pleased that you can you can uh, call in. We hope we can keep you on the line. So we'll just turn to you with whatever you want to say from your perspective of uh, sort of a grassroots, on the ground um, perspective on peace and how they're thinking about it. So over to you, David. Excellent. Thank you, Ambassador Mitchell, and good morning, everyone, uh, from Yangon. Um, there's three points I want to make, and, and I want to thank Vanessa and, and Mr. Nambia for an excellent overview of the peace process. Uh, the three points I want to make is, is observations from recent research uh, on the ground in various conflict areas uh, in the north. And unfortunately, it's not a very positive overview, um, because I think we have to start with an acknowledgement that active armed conflict and violence in many parts of Burma, in Myanmar, have actually increased uh, in the past year, the signing of, of the nationwide ceasefire agreement uh, last year. And the effects on the civilian population have, have been really quite, quite dire, and I think uh, continued armed conflict is actually thwarting efforts uh, for the peace process to move ahead. I'm just going to quickly move through several of the conflict areas and give you a sense of the concerns that a lot of people here have. Um, I, I think it's important to start with Kachin State, uh, which has seen a lot of violence over the past five years. There are still 100,000 civilians displaced. Uh, by that conflict, and there are almost daily engagements between the Tatmadaw and the Kachin Independence Army, including the use of airstrikes, and a lot of concerns this week that, that there could be an imminent uh, Myanmar army offensive against some of the Kachin uh, positions in, uh, in, in Kachin State. Um, moving east to Shan State, we see probably one of the most complicated uh, conflict areas in the world. Um, as, as Vanessa pointed out, the number of groups there is, is really quite staggering and incredibly complicated, the agendas that they have and the histories of, of their conflicts. Um, uh, starting with the, the Kachin Independence Army operating in, in western parts of Shan State, the Shan State Progress Party, which has been engaged in, in almost monthly conflict in the Myanmar military for the past seven years. Um, the TNLA, which is a new incarnation of the Baong Taang resistance army that has been around since the early 1970s and, and which is engaged with the Myanmar military on an almost daily basis. Um, the Restoration Council of Shan State, which is a signatory to the ceasefire from last year, which has moved significant numbers of troops into parts of northern Shan State and is engaging not just with the Tatmadaw but also against the TNLA. Um, and moving slightly east to that is, of course, United Wa State Army, which I would say really is the elephant in the room for the entire peace process and the conflict in Myanmar, uh, the biggest non-state armed group in the country, and recently embarked on a very disturbing um, intervention with their nominal ally, the, the NDAA, in the Mong La enclave, uh, which uh, is very pertinent to the ongoing peace discussions uh, with the government, um, in which the Mong La group seemed far more receptive to talking to the government about peace and which did not align with uh, the WA uh, political objectives. But also there are very significant military and economic reasons for why they moved into the Mong La area. And that is because they want to keep this arc of control that they have uh, along the China border and down to the Thai border, where they have a, a, a southern command along the Thai border, which has been there for about 15 years. 
um, and, and that has dramatically increased tensions within uh, northern and eastern Shan State. Uh, there's also been renewed fighting in Karen State um, between some uh, of the splinter groups of the Korean National Union, uh, which is another signatory to the nationwide ceasefire agreement, um, and pro Myanmar military uh, militias, um, and non signatory groups as well, um, which has displaced several thousand civilians in the past several weeks. Uh, unfortunately, we also see the Arakan Army, which was reformed and trained by the Kachin up in the north, which over the past year and a half has been sending troops down to southern Chin State and uh, the Rakhine State and actually staging operations ambushes against uh, the Tamador. Um, and the effects on civilians there has, has also been really quite dramatic. Um, in a general overview of, of, of looking at, at, at this renewed conflict on the ground, there, there are several things that, that I'd like to say. One is that, that the behaviour of the military has uh, modified um, in ways that we haven't seen in the past, um, and that has both negative and positive uh, elements to it. Uh, the negative uh, elements, I would say, is increased use of air power um, by the Myanmar military. There are almost daily airstrikes up in Kachin and, and regular airstrikes against positions in, in northern Shan State. Uh, but also, we see the Myanmar military in some ways modifying its behaviour in, in some areas. Uh, we're still getting um, very serious reports of human rights violations by the Myanmar military. Uh, but recently, um, uh, a, a killing of several men in northern Shan State was actually admitted to by the Myanmar military and, and both persons including senior officers, were actually prosecuted, which is a very positive move and something that the Myanmar military should be commended for doing. But it, it also leads into uh, a lot of hard work that I think a lot of us need to do in encouraging them to actually investigate uh, reports of, of other human rights violations uh, in, in these conflict areas and actually prosecute troops uh, that have been perpetrating human rights violations. That said, I think another important point that I want to make is that one of the issues that is, is detrimental to the peace process move, moving forward is an analysis of the human rights violations and the repression and the predatory taxation and, and other things that the ethnic armed organizations themselves are actually perpetrating against the local population. And, and that's not something that has been well documented or even acknowledged, uh, but it's certainly something that given the environment on the ground now, a lot of communities uh, are actually talking about. Um, and in some of the areas, particularly Northern Chan State, uh, a lot of communities talk about being preyed upon, abused, and uh, taxed by several different groups on a regular basis, not just the Myanmar military, but uh, different Shan factions, TNLA, uh, and others. And I think moving forward, we need to acknowledge that, that if we're going to do ceasefire monitoring or any kind of accountability for ongoing violations. It has to be across the board, and, and all groups uh, really should be uh, held to the same standard. Um, that said, there are the, the violations that, that we're documenting continue to be forced labor, extrajudicial killings, um, uh, and sexual violence perpetrated by, by all parties. However, uh, we do see that in, in, that in some areas, and the MR military has uh, actually addressed some of these issues, and, and we don't see the huge scale of forced labor and the preying on the population that we saw maybe 10 years ago. Um, and again, that's a positive trend to encourage all sides to actually observe uh, the rules of war and protect the civilian population. Uh, thing to, to just end on, on, on that first point, something that, that uh, I think any analysis of the peace process and the ongoing conflict uh, needs to look at, is there is a, a great deal of comparative analysis of different peace processes, uh, a lot of workshops and, and very positive stuff that, that's coming into Myanmar and talking to various actors involved in the peace process about comparative conflicts from around the world. But I think it's important for uh, not just an international understanding, but a domestic understanding um, of the conflict, um, and, and that is the, the long history of the war in Myanmar over the past six decades and previous peace efforts that have been made by the Myanmar military.
current and previous governments and the role of civilians within that. Um, there is a, a dearth of understanding, unfortunately, of previous efforts and the nature of why a lot of these, these uh, organisations have been fighting for so long. Uh, my second point that I, I think is, is very important uh, is disturbing reports of increased uh, uh, blockages of humanitarian assistance going to displaced uh, people in the north, especially Kachin State and Northern Shan State. And unfortunately, that needs to be coming from the Myanmar military. And uh, in, in some respects, much less from the ethnic organizations themselves. And I think uh, a major uh, element of the peace process really should be going on uh, all parties to the conflict and the government to permit unfettered humanitarian access in a lot of these areas because uh, the people in these areas are suffering quite a lot. And that's actually uh, thwarting uh, efforts to, to reach an agreement. Uh, my third point, and uh, I want to end on a very positive note here because uh, any analysis of, of the conflict and the peace process, uh, certainly uh, in, in the past couple of months, is necessarily very bleak um, and discouraging. Uh, but um, I want to emphasize that what I'm seeing on the ground when I speak to different communities uh, in Northern Shan State, especially, but also Kachin and, and other areas, is the exceptional role that, that local actors, civil society, uh, new members of parliament, and many others are playing in conflict mediation, in conflict mapping, and also in interventions with various armed groups, which includes very granular uh, local incidents where people have been abducted uh, or, or abused, um, and, and local actors, civil society, and, and especially local MPs, have actually been intervening with various authorities and improving the situation. Um, now, I think it's a, it's a fair criticism to be these so far that a lot of very crucial community uh, voices have been excluded from the process. Uh, certainly women's participation in the, in the peace process has been uh, unfortunately very limited and, and there seems to be very little commitment on the part of uh, not just the government but uh, the Tatmadaw itself but also the leadership of the ethnic armed organisations to the very important role that women's organisations should be playing. Uh, there's also a very rich uh, civil society that works on issues of resources, on land, the environment, and human rights documentation, as well as local journalists that, that actually document um, a lot of this stuff. And a lot of the frustrations that me and colleagues um, hear on a regular basis is that those voices aren't being heard. It, it seems to not be being transmitted to Yangon and Naypyidaw in, in the way that it really should. And there has been a lot of support and nurturing of civil society in Myanmar uh, by the international community. And, and, and you know, I, I want to recognize the great work that Ambassador Mitchell and his team at the embassy did uh, for several years of actually supporting civil society uh, uh, through the transition. And I think that needs to be augmented and increased um, across the board and to encourage the government to actually start listening to these communities more. Okay, you still there? No, we lost it. It's not like a good way to end. But I, you know. We should get him back. Okay, we'll get him back. Sorry, the number you have dialed is power off. I thought he was in Chiang Mai. That's actually pretty good for Myanmar. We kept him on that line. They're still working on it. Let me try again. Okay. We're sorry. Your call cannot be completed at this time. Okay. We'll try to get him back. Um, but no, we can continue to listen to David forever as, as uh, with these two on either side of me. Um, I think a couple of things come to mind. One, for those of you who are not initiated in this issue, I hope you're not deterred. <laughs> I mean, I, the, the danger of introducing this issue to folks in Washington is people go, oh my goodness, this is mind blowing. Um, and, and how do you wrap your mind around all the different acronyms and all the different groups. But 
that does give you a sense. This is not just the longest running civil conflict in the world, but it is the, probably the most complex peace process you will find anywhere. And we found we would bring folks in from other experiences, and you know, from Nepal or those who had done these things in other places, and they go, you know, we thought it was complicated to have two, maybe three groups you have to work with. 18, 20 groups, trying to get to corral all these different interests, all these different individual identities, groups, uh, acronyms. I mean, to try to corral that into a single unified peace approach is extraordinarily complex. Um, there were efforts to unify that voice. It is important that they be unified. The danger of splitting between signatories, non-signatories is, I think, um, a pernicious one. It's, a, it's one, but they all have different different interests, and they have different histories, and they have different needs and desires, even if overall they're looking for respect and dignity and, and the rest. But uh, it requires, obviously, a great deal of patience, and it requires a great deal of understanding uh, by all of us, uh, because there's a lot at stake. Uh, if they don't get this right, then not much else is going to go right in the country. Uh, includes democracy, includes all the desires of constitutional change, et cetera. So it behooves us to at least start to understand it and recognize that both under Understanding and patience are in order. Having said that, let me ask the first question. I do want to turn to the audience since you've been listening to a lot of folks for an hour. Um, but one of the things that Dasu, uh, and one more thing I want to say, uh, one last thing, uh, is just an individual. What David was saying at the end about the embassy and what we were doing on civil society, that was largely done by Jessica Davey, who's right over there. <laughs> so I do want to give credit where credit's due. The partners uh, that we had, uh, whether it was NGOs or people in the embassy, should get their due and Jessica was absolutely essential in that. Um, Aung San Suu Kyi now is talking, and we hear about her pushing a timeline. We want to get all signatories in. Everyone should sign by the next round of the Panglong Dialogue, which will be in February of next year. Um, she's talking about an Irish, kind of an Ireland approach, where there need to be a timeline, which I think, in essence, is a good one, so it can't be an open-ended process. But I want to get your sense <clears throat> whether, I mean, what the pros and cons of that <clears throat> are, um, how do folks think about that? Is that a reasonable way of looking at this, given your experience, VJ, of how open-ended this has been? Do you need to light a fire under this in order to for force folks to move forward um, and then have these parallel processes at local levels? Do you think overall that's, that's wise? I think, well, just to give a quick re response, I think uh, to some extent the the need to uh, to push them to get to commit is is there is obvious because uh, there is a tendency for people to keep holding back at the, uh, the last but they keep they're very positive but when it comes to actually committing there's always it's it's natural in some ways it's you know the a kind of a reluctance grown out of years of mistrust and and uh, and, un and suspicion unwillingness to accept that the other side, the government is really eventually going to come around and actually, you know, stand by what they write or what they've signed on. So there is a, there is a, and, and there is also a sense of, you know, are we getting, uh, getting ourselves into a kind of a trap? There is, so you need to push them to be, make some commitment to an extent. But I think much of it is really how it is done rather than that it is done. I, there's, no, there's no one who can argue that it should not be done. But I think it, the question of having a kind of sense of personal involvement, trust, and, and showing it in different ways and in an informal way, I think is very important. With the army, that has not yet developed. I think they are predisposed to believing the lady in some ways and that she is committed to it. But I think within the army too, I think there are leaders who are coming up and they're already starting to show some indications of believability, credibility in terms of commitments. Even this latest, what uh, David was mentioning about the actions they've taken against certain of their of the of the uh, people in the in the the, the soldiers who have who have uh, made human rights I mean committed human rights violations, etc. That is one confidence building measure. But I think it is it has to go a little beyond that. There has to be a much more. Uh, let's say, consistent, informal contact building. That was being done by Uong Min with some of the people. I think it needs to be built much faster. And unless that happens, to an extent, the Irish formula is really, I mean, well, Jonathan Powell is in, involved in this, so in a sense, it is easy to take the, but to, 
I think man, while I just started off by saying Myanmar's uh, experiences are not that different, but in some respects it is sui generis also, because as you said, the very size, the complexity, and the numbers of, of, of groups involved, I think there has to, and also the method in which the negotiators, in a sense, it's, I, I certainly don't think that there is an Eastern method and a Western method or anything like that, but there are certain cultural norms over there inside Myanmar which need to be moved forward. And I think that pushing them, having a, 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 thing, a, a deadline is good, but it has to be a kind of a mix of flexibility and holding them to a deadline. I think that's open enough. That's good. Okay. All right, let, let's do open it up for comments, questions, uh, issues. Yes, sir. And if you could introduce yourself as well, as you would. Hello. Yeah, my name is Tan Luen Ton, um, voice of America Burmese Service. So we all know that uh, National League for Democracy government, led by Aung San Suu Kyi and uh, Utin Cho, have um, uh, delicate and a difficult and a sensitive relationship to maintain with the Myanmar army, Tamil. Um, especially to, uh, in the peace negotiation process. Uh, but my observation is that this is, it is more or less the same for the pre previous government led by President Thein Sein. The army not always listened to the, what President Thein Sein said. And uh, we all know that uh, chief uh, government negotiator Wu Aumei has uh, uh, go back and forth to uh, kind of a patch up negotiation with the armed rebels group and army. But uh, what we observe is that uh, one uh, kind of uh, uh, fighting resume between uh, Kachin in the north and uh, Myanmar army in uh, uh, 2011. And uh, at the time, uh, around uh, uh, 2011, December, President Thein Sein declared unilateral ceasefire. Although uh, we all know that army not always listen to him, he just showed the gesture just to uh, build up the confidence. But what we are like uh, or to see for the moment is not from the uh, NLD government led by Wu Teng Chou and Aung San Suu Kyi make that kind of uh, or to show that kind of gesture to uh, build that confidence. So I'd like to hear your comment on that, uh, Mr. Nambia, especially. I, it's, I, I'm a little hesitant to comment on it, mainly because the previous government was essentially army. In a sense, the president was a former army man. So there was a kind of a relationship, and the the, the, the contact points, despite the fact that the, that the army may have been a little reluctant to accept some, they essentially obeyed orders. And I think the, the order coming from the president, which was a former, who was a former army person, actually made a difference. Even, in fact, even the, even the commander in chief was technically, in a sense, junior to the, uh, the president, even in terms of the courses they attended. So in that sense, there is a, a, a hierarchy. Now you're facing a totally different situation of a civilian government and an army. And there, you are actually already seeing a certain amount of uh, problems relating to the possible dilution or intent by the civilian government to dilute the authority of the army. I don't know if there is that kind of equation which has already been established between the president and uh, Dao Su on the one hand and the lady and the, and the army and the, the commander in chief, but I think it is growing, it is building up. Uh, for the current situation in Kachin, for the president to be able to say directly that you should have a unilateral ceasefire, I think would probably be unrealistic, because I don't think the army is likely to be able to accept. In fact, the confidence of the army in the new government, in being able to manage the peace process, has not yet, in my personal opinion, been established. I don't think there's yet that kind of confidence that they are in control of the situation. There is a sense that they are not fully in control of the situation. And the army is worried that if you give, because technically, this can be a slippery slope. And I think that is the reason why the army at this stage is being much more would be, and we have actually, uh, the UN has been taking action, is to directly get to the army, to the commander-in-chief and say, even if the 
president doesn't need to tell them. If the commander in chief was to take a decision to have a unilateral ceasefire in this particular place, that would be a lot more credible. And I think that would in fact strengthen her relationship with the civil, with, I mean, his relationship with the civilian government and with her. And I think that is the political kind of argument we've been trying to use with them, with the army, saying it is up to you at this stage. Because your army, as a, the Myanmar army, is actually in a phase of change. It's unwilling to some extent, but it is committed to it, and it has publicly committed itself to moving in that direction. So I think it is, at this stage, it's, uh, we think, I think that it is more important to get the military leadership at the first, second, and third level to be able to say, look at the political complexities. You have already taken some views, some actions to become more responsible as an army which is working under a civilian leadership. You have your concerns, fine, but you should now behave with a certain amount of statesmanship, and therefore a unilateral uh, a kind of, uh, we, did, we didn't specifically mention or suggest to them a unilateral ceasefire, but we did say that you must look at establishing informal contacts to come to an arrangement, like, you know, to lower the, the, uh, the, the levels of your tension. I think that's the furthest which uh, I think could be realistic at the present moment. Just, David, are you, are you back on the line? I am. I'll be near you. Yeah, well, you cut off uh, at one moment. Do you have any final words or any comments on this particular item? <clears throat> uh, on on the, the Federal Army issue that, that Mr. Nambia just outlined, or, or anything else in particular? Well, the question was about uh, the relationship between the NLD and the, and the military and, and uh, effect on peace, but you were cut off at the end of your comments, if you have anything further to say on that, from your initial comments. Uh, no, I think, no. No, I, th I think we should just, just keep the discussion going. I don't want to bog it down. Okay. All right. Open up for any other questions? Yes, sir. So Seth Eisen, Washington University in St. Louis. To uh, what, what is the source of funding uh, for the military uh, interventions by the ethnic groups? Uh, where, where, how do they get their military supplies? Are there are foreign governments involved in supporting the military efforts? And if so, to what extent and why? <laughs> Vanessa can start. David can add. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't have a comprehensive answer on that, and I don't think uh, any comprehensive sort of analysis has, has ever really been done um, of it. Um, but I mean, sources of funding vary widely, um, and some some groups, in fact, have have um, you know significant sources of funding, like the WAR, um, and other groups have very little funding. So it, it varies enormously as to, as to the amount of access to funding and um, and resources and weapons and and the um, uh, uh, and the type as well. But um, Look, uh, you know, the, um, there's been decades of, of uh, black market trade, um, which the, some of the ethnic armed groups have participated in, which is one source. Um, they they tax. They, I mean, they, they, the armed groups have territories um, and um, and bases, and they they, um, they 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 collect taxes um, from businesses and from uh, from from travellers, from trucks and, and cars coming through. Um, so, I mean, sources of revenue. There's all sorts of sources of revenue. Um, um, in terms of um, foreign patrons, <laughs> um, perhaps I'll let others comment on that. <laughs> we can ask David. David, do you want to comment on this as a researcher? And um, I, I think one um, uh, important element of this is that the uh, the Myanmar military uh, Tamador, um, have produced their own infantry weapons for quite some time with this huge network of Kapata defense industry factories in the center of the country. Uh, they have been... We'll get him back and we'll definitely get him to comment on this. Um, let's see if we can get him back quickly. And so I can comment a little bit about this question too. No. <laughs> um, just one more time, no? Well, the, yeah. on your specific question on ethnic armed groups, I mean, they, they, I think what Vanessa said in terms of 
internally, taxes and all the rest. The resources in these areas are, are substantial. I mean, you go to Kachin State, there's jade, there's timber, there's gold. I mean, the thing about Myanmar is it's an extremely rich country in terms of resources. And the Chinese have a term for it, the beggar with a golden bowl, <laughs> that they're poor and yet they're extraordinarily rich in resources. And a lot of the resources are in these um, outlying areas, the ethnic areas, which is one of the sources of conflict, you know, you could say, and could be one of the spoilers in reaching peace. Because control of these resources means control of tremendous wealth. Um, and over the years, there have been exploitation by businessmen, by outsiders, as mafias, well as mafias, mafias, yeah, and militias and ethnic groups that that operate like that. I mean, it's you have that kind of money at stake, you're going to have that kind of activity. That's not to say that all the ethnic groups are simply mafias. They're they're also seeking. Um, their rights and, and uh, yeah, the tremendous grievance on, on issues of uh, identity and respect for uh, equality within uh, a state, a unified state. So it's a, it's a checkered issue. Uh, and these groups also believe that this is their territory. Kachin say, we have a state, this is our state. We should, we originally, they wanted to be independent in Karen. They had ideas of being independent or Shan. They're not looking for that anymore, but that identity that this is, we control our own territory and we're not gonna let these outsiders in, gives them the sense that these resources may be exploited by us because these are ours. Uh, and the center says this is the country, the national resources, and we want to exploit. So it is a driver of conflict. It is a result of conflict. It is circular in that sense. Um, so whether it's jade, gold, timber, whatever, selling that, smuggling that, moving that has been a, a large source of uh, their weapons and their, their money that is inside and outside the country. Uh, outsiders that support it, I mean, there are, there'll be various groups. Uh, when it comes to the WA and some along the border, there's been talk of the Chinese support. Uh, the WA used to be the part of the Burmese Communist Party until they got rid of the, that moniker. They gave up an insurgency and became the WA, uh, a different kind of um, identity. But strong connections historically and um, linguistically and culturally with those across the border. So there's variety of, there's a lot of uncertainty of where all of it is coming from. Um, but clearly these networks had formed over many decades and they still exist to support these groups. And they're an obstacle to peace among some. That's a, and a question of how do you get a resolution of peace? Because then you have to deal with these big financial questions where people have enormous interests in the status quo. So I think there are some in the government that think no, they don't, some of these folks really don't want peace because they're making their money. So that's where a lot of the mistrust comes from that needs to be built up as, as VJ talked about through good faith efforts of dialogue uh, over time. Um, so that's my answer to it, but you yeah, do have maybe just add one. Um, I mean, I think and one, one curious aspect, I guess, though, also is that there are a lot of um, licit legal businesses that are owned by the ethnic armed groups, and, and, um, and in, in, in some of the negotiations over the last five years, that um, uh, uh, establishing those businesses has been one of the um, parts of the agreement with a, a specific ethnic armed group. So, um, so that's, there's a whole other layer to it. And I think, um, you know, now that the, the eight signatories to the nationwide ceasefire agreement are um, a D well, they're, they're now legal organisations. There'll be more. Um, there'll be more leeway for them to do that. Um, you know, there are. I mean, there are, there are shops. There are petrol stations. There. Are, I mean, you see. You know, um, you go to um, the, some of the border areas. But people will point them out to you. You know, this this belongs to the RCSS. This belongs to the KNU, etc. So, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a there's a whole sort of legal side of it as well, or quasi legal side um, to to armed group revenue too. Creates a lot of mistrust within the government as well towards outsiders, all of them who can, you know, the suspicion that big powers are trying to support division of the country. I mean, it's very much part of their identity of, of vulnerability and insecurity about outsiders. As if yep. this, uh, just one point I wanted to make, as if this is not enough, there are additional layers of complexity in terms of the larger political principles, as it were. You're seeing on the one hand, progressively in many of these areas, rights uh, of communities are being, ethnic groups as groups are being put. 
What about the rights of individuals? How do you juxtapose the rights of individuals and the rights of communities? So that is that kind of, you know, there's, it's how, because as you get closer and closer to a political uh, discussion, a dialogue, I, you're going to the party, not the armed groups alone, because many of the armed groups are really, as I said, groups of, who are in a sense elites and establishments. You have to, how do you move down the layer to the, your common people, and that's going to come, that's going to come very quickly. The second thing is, you're talking of inclusivity in terms of organizing people around the table, but then what about the exceptionalism which individual communities have, particularly the richer groups in, in, in some parts? How about juxtaposing that with the need to eliminate poverty, great, uh, you know, abysmal poverty in some parts? How do you use that? And some of them want to be treated, some of these groups want to be treated as separate, and they have the, 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 the there are vast riches in, in Kachin, for example. Now, it can't remain only for the for the Kachins to be to utilize just because of the accident of history. They are part of the larger nation. How do you use that to equalize it? These are huge problems which are going to come down the way. The and this, that's the political dialogue. And that cannot come unless you have, one, a political dialogue, and you have a political dialogue where people from all communities, I mean, not just communities, people from all levels, even within communities, are able to speak and speak to the larger issues of social justice. It's not justice between one region and another, but justice between different levels of people. So it's going to be it's going to be a huge thing, and the only way to discuss it is through the open democratic process where people, you know, a, a press and, and, and institutions, the larger institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Ben, please. Um, I must have <coughs> I must have missed this, uh, but did any of the distinguished speakers mention the Roginia? Not yet. No, <laughs> no, one thing I wanted to say at the start, and we can address this, um, is the conversation about the peace process is not meant to ignore the other problems of the country, and particularly in Rakhine State with the Rohingya, um, which is a huge issue for the country, huge issue in terms of um, you know, human rights and concern about atrocities and, and all the rest. It is not particularly a peace process issue. Um, and maybe it's a, quite a complicated issue. We can have a whole other conversation about that. Um, it is an elephant in, in the room, in the big room, but the, it's not, a, not necessarily in this room. I was worried about that. <laughs> but know. it does get to the issue of Rakhine. Yeah. Rakhine is another ethnic group. And they themselves are like Kachin and others who believe that they were independent at one time, they were, they're viable, their identities at stake. And the Rohingya are, are a function of that. They feel the Rohingya are affecting their identity, their ability to have um, their own control of their territory. And so you have, as we talk about divisions and the fractiousness and the complexity, you have ethnic linguistic differences and you have religion and you have race. All these things are playing into it. The Rohingya are a subset, in essence, of those questions, which are also going to be, have to be wrapped up in a broader term, national reconciliation, I guess, which is beyond peace. Peace has to do with these particular civil conflicts and fighting among ethnic groups. <clears throat> but then, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> how do you deal with legacies of religious difference of racial difference <coughs> and things like the Rohingya. I'm sorry. Institutionalized discrimination is a big problem. I mean, there's, there's no question that it is an issue which has been raised time and again by institutions like the United Nations in our discussions all through. And the fact is, one of the major elements in this whole issue of institutionalized discrimination relates to what is happening in Rakhine. There's no doubt about that. It is an important issue that needs to be taken. In fact, it's some kind of, slowly with, with the activities of the Arakan army now particularly, some of the public statements they've been making, even in the context of the recent developments, are a little frightening also because it can actually enhance the polar, it can ag aggravate the polarization between the communities over there. Now, this is not to suggest that it is, it's being, uh, the, the government is addressing these, and they, of course, the huge stereotypes which have been built over the years, over the, over, over the years, particularly in recent history, but I think Daosu has has mentioned that this would be an important priority. She has actually established a commission, which is a national commission, but which is in fact chaired by the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan. Now, it is a complex issue. It's an issue where human rights issues or values have to be, have to be in a sense, uh, 
uh, juxtaposed with traditional sort of you know traditional attitudes within communities in order to have them mediated in a manner which doesn't break up the break up the stability of the state but at the same time builds a kind of a, in, certainly in Rakhine there is a drastic need for a kind almost a new social contract between the communities they have lived in the past but there has been you know there is a complex history of migrations from the subcontinent, particularly from uh, from the Indian subcontinent, and that has to be brought into the discussion. Bangladesh and others have to be brought into the discussion, and I think that's the way in which they are proceeding. Yeah, but I mean, if we're going to use the you know Kofi Annan, the Bosnia, you, you know, the negotiations went on when the, while the genocide continued, continued, and the Rohingya people there in dire situation. I understand they're in concentration camps. They can't work. They can't go to school. No food. I mean, they don't have citizenship rights. 21st century civilized humanity. Are we really civilized? And it wasn't the United Nations founded in order to prevent what's happening to the Rohingya from, from you know, happening? I'm sorry, I'm just being a little bit, you know, I mean, this is, we, it's, yeah, I mean, it, I, yeah, just, I mean, it's absolutely, Rakhine and Rohingya issues are absolutely a topic that deserves um, a whole other conversation, I think. Um, but I just wanted to make a quick point about this, and that is, I think there are, I think there are a Thank number you. of um, places in which the, the, the peace process between the ethnic armed groups and the government and, and the, the broader question of national identity, citizenship, um, what's going on in Rakhine, they, they do intersect, and um, both in terms of the root causes, the discrimination, um, national identity and so on. Um, and I think, um, and it's interesting to note, I just wanted to point out that in the um, plan for the political dialogue in the, um, I think it's in the social issues sector, um, in March to July 2017, there is a plan to discuss religion as part of the political dialogue process. So I think that will be a very interesting um, conversation that will um, uh, that will raise a lot of these sort of long-term um, issues with a broader, um, broader group of people. Um, yeah. So it is being addressed through the political dialogue. I don't know how successfully it'll be addressed. Yeah, that's the broader religious question. You're right, the issue of the Rohingya and Rakhine is an extraordinarily um, important issue for our attention. The UN pays a lot of attention to this, believe me, on the ground. We did. Yeah. It's very actually, <coughs> they just come, a group went yesterday along the road with uh, a group of uh, heads of mission. The yep. resident coordinator was in Rakhine, into the very, very villages which were affected by the latest disturbance. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's not technically a peace process. The, the difference as well is that with the peace process, these groups are, the government wants them part of the country. They're considered part of the country. The, in history, these groups want to be separate. But with the Rohingya, unfortunately, they're not accepted by a vast majority of the people, even as part of the country. They're viewed as illegal immigrants by many people. The name Rohingya isn't accepted. I mean, they have, they're stateless. There's been a history of no, migration from that. Part. So it's dealing with that question where most of the people, even many in the ethnic areas, the ethnic minority or ethnic nationalities, don't even consider them part of a process. They shouldn't even be in the country. They should go back, I mean, exactly. They think they should go back to Bangladesh. That's where they view them having come from. This is the mindset. They, this is why we can't get into this discussion, is that you start discussing it, <clears throat> the complexities of this issue, and the history of this issue are there. And we will do that here. We want to do that as, a, as part of a series here. But I, I made a mistake not addressing this early on, that this is a serious issue. We're not going to address it here because it's a whole, very much a sui generis issue. But that doesn't mean it's subordinate to peace or not as important as peace. It is extremely important. And if things go badly, as we're watching day by day in Rakhine State, with it, that can also set back the entire um, situation inside the country. So a lot is at stake in Rakhine. Yes, let me get, we're running out of time, but let me have one final question. Hi, uh, Dan Sullivan with Refugees International. Um, I share David's concerns about the, um, the blocking of humanitarian aid. Um, but also in the longer term about, uh, curious what the, the discussions are within the peace process and, and more broadly about the long-term uh, returns of, of IDPs. And then we also saw recently the first pilot returns from Thailand. And so both in terms of IDPs and refugees and returns, um, what, where conversations are on that and what we can expect uh, going forward. Thanks. I don't have much information, but clearly the idea is that 
the kind of confidence in the process has not reached a stage where voluntary returns will be will 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 start happening in in any in any meaningful manner. I think the the. In fact, even the question of developing certain areas in the former black zones, etc., has become a, pro a problem inside the country because the government, when the government decides to, or whenever the government has made certain moves to have some development in those regions, which have just, just on the border, the ethnic armed groups themselves have problems because they think that this is being used by, that this will be used by the government as a way to, to show itself in better light with vis-a-vis -vis the local communities. And therefore, there is that itself is becoming an object of tension. I think the confidence between both sides that this process is reaching a self-sustaining kind of basis has not yet happened. And unless that happens, communities are not really going to come. You're going to, it will, it, it has to take, it has to take place at a certain uh, stage in the process which has not yet been reached. That's, at least that's my my understanding of the situation. Of course, the question of attending to the immediate humanitarian issues of the people where they are, that continues to be a problem. That I think that that is being addressed. The government is also addressing it. International community donor groups are addressing it. And to have for example, issues like demining. We talk, there have been a lot of talk about demining, but actually that has not really started in real earnest. That is the first step towards getting people back. Then there are some, in some respects, there are an entire generations that have developed outside the country. Many of them, if they return to the places of their former, uh, you know, of their former domicile, you'd find that properties, etc., have changed hands at least two or three times. And so, in a sense, the new generation doesn't find any place they want to go back. There are these kind of problems which I've at least experienced with local communities, leaders of local communities, etc. It's a it's a stage which will which will take place. It will happen, but uh, I think this is going to happen once there's much greater confidence in the stability of the peace process. Okay, we're a little bit over time, but there's so much more we can say on this. This is a start. Mm -hmm. This will be to be continued, uh, in essence, in the conversation. Yeah, for a final comment, maybe you turn to the ambassador for a stand, please. Uh, I would like to make a comment. Uh, this uh, event has uh, really deepened and enlightened my knowledge on the peace process in our country. Thank you very much, uh, BJ, and also Vanessa. One thing uh, no one will deny is that the process is so complicated. We all know that the quote. However, all the stakeholders and also know that it is important to remain in the union. In the past, the, uh, uh, in the past, uh, the ethnic armed groups uh, even tried to secede from the state. That was uh, in the 1947 Constitution. But at present, this is no more, and that they are not asking for it anymore. It is important for us to maintain the union. That is why the NL government is trying so hard and also working very closely with the armed forces, the Tamaro. Tamaro, from the very beginning of the independence, has a very formidable uh, institution, and we must realize that uh, it has, uh, it has, uh, uh, it took control of the country for over 50 years. It is important for us to understand the role of the Tamaro. That is why the NLD government is working so hard to bring the Tamaro into the nation building. For the outsiders, for the well-wishers, please do realize this uh, role of the Tamador, and please support our country, and please also, on one uh, on one hand, if you have any uh, if you have any encounter with the people from the Tamador, make them convinced that this is the part of the nation building. This is very very important. We cannot we cannot leave the Tamaro to be like the past. We must bring them together in the nation building. This is so important for us. That is the message that I wish to uh, 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 give, and this is how we are trying so hard to uh, bring the Tamaro together in the nation building process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. That's a great way to end this. So thank you all for coming.
Thank you.